Hey YouTube, this is Pruitt, and this is Jim Davis. And on today's web DM, we're gonna do a favor for new players and teach you how to play fifth edition Dungeons and Dragons and think about how to play it. So let's get to rolling and may the dice ever roll in your favor. All right, Jim Davis. Screw it. We have kind of broached this subject before, like our, what, second or third video? Yeah, way back in that first okay. series of videos we did, I think we spoke for like four minutes. Like on four minutes. Pre on like character creation and like getting into getting into roles. Right, so like let's revisit that. You know, in the same way that our new DM videos were really targeted for that, that, that DM who this week yeah. decided they were going to start their first campaign. Yeah. These are for the player who's like, this week you decided to join your first D&D game. Right. Uh, specifically 5th edition, uh, this, like the new DMs show, this is going to be a two-parter. We're going to talk a bit about sort of the general, what is role-playing, kind yeah. of give you our perspective on it, what can you do in a role-playing game. Yeah. And then the second part of this series will be actually walking you through character creation. We'll walk you through those decisions that you're going to have to make. That's really what this is. If you've yeah. got a player at your table who's brand new, Maybe you point them to this video, uh, but if you are a veteran player, you know maybe you'll find something interesting that we're talking about. And either way, they're probably here just to look at that punum. Probably not for my puns, though. Oh. Anyway. Oh, Pruitt. What is this? What is this thing we call role playing? Is it make believe? Is it a board game? It's got elements of video gaming and improv and storytelling. A very encapsulated history of role playing. It grew out of miniatures wargaming and hex encounter wargaming mm -hmm. that stretches back a century or more. In the 70s, uh, a, a you know, group of people were, were playing these sort of miniatures wargaming. They had a set of rules for it. Then they were like, hey, what if we took individual miniatures and individual soldiers out of here, put them in a fantasy milieu, uh, yeah. in, in this case, the dungeon uh, of, of both Greyhawk and Blackmoor, uh, Gygax and Arneson, uh, you know, the two creators, founders of Dungeons and Dragons, got together, created this game, and here we are, decades right. later, uh, with Dungeons and Dragons having influenced a whole number of video games uh, of, 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 of fantasy literature, mm -hmm. uh, to the point where it's sort of like, it now is almost referencing itself. Uh, it's been around so long, and its influence, even if not its popularity, uh, right. has been so pervasive. It's a role-playing game, so that means you can do anything, right? You, you, right? So what, what, what can you do? The flippant and I find unhelpful answer is you can do whatever you want. Right. And, and even for veteran players, telling them, do whatever you want, often very leads to analysis paralysis and too, too much choice. Mm -hmm. And so it's one of those things where maybe a new player to this game, uh, or, you know, or even newer players, can get to a point where they feel like, all right, I don't know what to do. They're, maybe they're used to thinking it, uh, of games and this kind of uh, you know, pastime in terms of winners and losers. It's possible to lose this game. Uh, and I don't want to lose, uh, and so they might worry that they're not making the best choice. What you can do in a role-playing game is basically the, the dungeon master is gonna yes. sit down and prepare some kind of scenario. It might be from a book that they purchased, it might be something that they created themselves, or a combination of the two, and they're gonna present you with this scenario, which mm -hmm. is in a fantasy make-believe world, and you basically are there controlling one character in that world, yeah making decisions based on that character yeah. and problem solving, right. uh, engaging uh, with the, the problem or scenario that the dungeon master has created. Mm -hmm. And in a perfect world, you would be as engaged in that uh, scenario as you want it to be. If it was one of those things where you just like showing up because you like hanging out with your friends, you don't want to have to worry too much about overthinking it or, or worried about making the right decision, you just want to be there and hang out, then that should be an okay way to play the game. But if you also want to get really into it, understand what the Dungeon Master has set up for you, how they've created their world, what place your character has in it, then mm -hmm. that's, that's also a uh, one way to play. Yeah. So um, let's 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 get into some of the basics, right. okay? And we'll, and one of the most basic things about D and D and role playing games usually mm -hmm. is that you're going to use some form of die. You're going to use some form of you're die. Some dice. Yes. You need dice. You need dice. Right. Although you don't need to own your own set of dice immediately. Right. You can build up a collection. Right. Um, and I, I think that dice are, are a rather intimidating thing for new players. First off, there's a lot of different kinds and varieties of dice. There's mm -hmm. a, a jargon that goes with them. The way that Dungeons and & Dragons and role-playing games in general 
has a kind of notation or, or jargon for dice is that D stands for dice. So mm -hmm. a D4 is a single four-sided die. A D20 is a single 20-sided die. Um, and then from there, you would go 3D6 or three six-sided dice. Right. You know, for new players, really what you need to start playing the game uh, is a single D20, and that's it. You really shouldn't need much, much more. You don't even need that. Right. You can show up to a game with, with nothing, mm -hmm. and as long as you're not playing with people who are like completely selfish, <laughs> you should be able to borrow a die, uh, use something, uh, use a table die, something like that. Mm. Well, I would and ask. I'll, I'll, and also in the 21st century, you can get a die, you can get a die, die rolling, rolling app. app. Although there are some dungeon masters who do not like die rolling apps. They don't they don't want them at their table. I would be happy to, you know, let a player use them. And in some cases, if uh, there are some characters where you need those die rolling apps because you might not have the number of dice that uh, say a spell calls for mm -hmm. or, or something. As role players as nerds, we we have our, we have a lot of uh, Peculiarities, superstitions, habits, traditions. Oh yes. I would just this is a blanket statement of just don't grab someone's die at the table and, and use it without asking. Well, yeah, you don't. You just don't want to grab them by the dice bag, right? <laughs> the people got uh, people might get really they they might they might have a set of dice that is theirs. Yes. Particular to this character or this campaign. Mm -hmm. I play in a style where I usually only use a fraction of the dice that I, I might bring with me, and so I've always got some as a dungeon master on hand. Oh yes. I do think that as your dungeon master should provide you with dice if you don't have any. But mm -hmm. maybe they don't have that many dice. Mm -hmm. um, and so it might be one of those things that you have to share one or something. Just know that you know if you're new to the game, you might just think, oh, it's a die. I'm used to playing a board game where everybody shares a, you know, a set of dice. Yeah. Um, but in this particular instance, <laughs> you, know, you never know who you're going to like. Really upset. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you yeah. just reach over, grab their 2d20 and start rolling it. Yeah, uh, they're, they're then they might be like, wait, that's mine, and now it's tainted, and I gotta smash this dice with a hammer. <laughs> <laughs> that kind or just of thing. cut it in half. Cut it in half. Uh, and get rid of your bad mojo. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, you know, I'm 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 mildly particular about my dice, but as you can see, I usually always have. Uh, you a just have a ton of it, yes. I mean, like, <laughs> and I usually only use like two sets, and there's a lot of these I've never I haven't used in years. We've had some we've had some people ask if they if I can show my dice collection. Maybe we'll post a picture on our Twitter feed. I keep mine just in a Tupperware. It's big. Yeah. <laughs> that I keep. Yeah, you don't mess it's around. Big, and you don't need that many. If yeah. you want to get your own, like I said, you need enough dice that I, I would recommend 2d20. If you're playing 5th edition, there's a lot of times where you have to roll 2d20 and select either the highest or the lowest, depending on if you have advantage or disadvantage, which we will get into mm -hmm. when we kind of go into a bit more of the, the particulars of 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons. Right. Uh, and then whatever damage die on whatever weapon or spell that you use most often, probably want that one. So you're looking at maybe three or four... Uh, dice that you have that you take with you. They don't, you know, they sell like pre-made packages of it. You can buy bin dice. I yeah, love yeah. bin dice. You pick the diamond in the rough that you want out of it. Uh, some people don't like bin dice. They see them as betrayers and well, salacious dice. Well, I mean, every every person who's come in that shop has put their hands on the them. grubby little hands oh, all over those just, dice. Just touch them. I prefer an experienced dice that knows itself. Yeah. And what it wants. It's been around the block once. Or, it's, it's rolled around the block once or twice. You know, right. it's, not, it's not concerned. Uh, that hasn't just lived its life in a plastic case till the first time it's rolled. Knows its way around a hand. Right. Um, <laughs> We've been stretching this out for a while. Anyway. Uh, so that, that's sort of, all this is a very brief aside. There's a ton of other stuff that, that people will try to sell you for role-playing games. And some of it might be useful. Dice towers, dice rolling trays. Trays, yeah. Different things that you need for your character, whether it's a wooden box to put your miniature and your dice and your thing in. I mean, there's a lot of stuff like that. Those are all nice. And some people really like getting into it and they like the stuff that comes with Dungeons mm -hmm. and Dragons. But in order to play the game, you really just need like two or three dice and a blank sheet of paper and something to write with. Yeah. And and from there, you you buy your you buy uh, your dice bag that comes with a bottle of Crown Royal, and you uh, <laughs> you know or you get the one of the chainmail ones that they uh, mm -hmm. sometimes sell, or you just put them in a Ziploc bag, whatever it is that you need. Well, Jim, let's let's get into a little bit more of the the, the kind of the rules of, of of what you need to be aware of going in. And I think we should we should start with like the types of play. Because we're going to get into like race and class and background and what that means. Right, how to select your a, character. How to make a character. Yeah, right. We'll get into that eventually. But yeah. either way, you're going to have a character, and so, that character is going to have to interact with the game. It is. 
in these three ways. So go ahead and go through that. So for 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons, uh, they identify sort of these, what they call three pillars of play. And this is a good time to say that if you're a new player, uh, at some point you will want to read or pick up or borrow a player's handbook. It is not necessary to start playing the game to own a player's handbook. There are free rules available that will let you make a wide variety of characters with them. Player's Handbook just has more options in them. But at some point, you're going to want access to a player's handbook. Mm -hmm. and much like dice, you want to make sure that you ask before you borrow a, a fellow player's, uh, player's handbook. But in the player's handbook, there's a, there, there are a couple of chapters. There's the first chapter, which is kind of a basic rundown of how to play the game. And then the next chapter is like a step-by-step walkthrough of, of creating a character. And that first chapter on how to play the game I think is really valuable. A lot of people, it seems like they skip it or they go right to the, the section on races and classes. But those first couple of sections of the player's handbook are really valuable for new players. And one of the things they contain is this discussion of three pillars of play. And they are combat, which is central to Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah. Dungeons and Dragons, if anything else, is a game of heroic action in a fantasy setting. And so combat features heavily in most Dungeons and Dragons games. It's a it's a feature of the system itself. There are other role playing games out there where combat is less uh, of a central focus. But we you play in D and D. It's time to kick down the door and kill some orcs, mm -hmm. uh, and that's why a lot of people uh, like the game. And then the other two are environmental exploration, whether traveling in the wilderness or exploring a location. And then the third is uh, interaction and and role playing. Yeah. Uh, although. I kind of think see role playing occurring in all three pillars. Wait, in well, our opportunities for yeah. It. I mean, I think it, it, it just to me it's just more social interaction. It, yeah, it, social it, interaction with NPCs. You, you can fight with your sword, or you can fight with your tongue. Right. You know. And so I find the pillars of play useful, particularly for new players to think about, because it it it, it fits what you're going to be doing in the game into three broad categories. Mm -hmm. And you can start to think of your character that you're creating as going like, okay, what are they good at in each of the pillars of play? Most campaigns are going to feature these three pillars in some degree or another. I have never, ever, in all the time I've role played and, and played different systems and games, been in a game that was 100% one way. Right. Never been in one that was 100% combat or 100% um, social interaction. There's always mm -hmm. been a mix. It's useful to kind of think, all right, Combat, am I going to be attacking? Mm -hmm. What does that mean? Do I know what dice I need to roll when I attack? Do I need to know the number that I need to hit on those mm -hmm. dice? It's okay to ask those questions. Right. You know, role playing is one of those things where it's a social situation, there's all kinds of anxieties and worries, particularly if you're playing with people you don't know or that you, you know, you're only playing with once a week. Mm -hmm. You don't want to look stupid in front of them, you don't want to seem like you don't know, but it never hurts to ask. And unless the DM's a huge jerk, Mm -hmm. <laughs> and and makes that li makes your life difficult in that regard, which is a good reason to get out of there. Right. Uh, then you should be able to ask the DM, hey, what number should I be be aiming to roll on this die? Some DMs aren't going to tell you the armor class of, of a monster that you're trying to hit. An armor class in this case is the number you need to roll equal to or greater than in order to hit that monster. Right. And so they might just say, pick up that d20 and roll it add a certain number to it, mm -hmm. tell me what you get. So understanding uh, you know, when you say you're gonna make an attack, what do I need to roll? Uh, do I, am I rolling with advantage or disadvantage? Make sure that you know that. If you're rolling with advantage, you're rolling two d20s, taking the highest one. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're rolling with disadvantage, you're rolling two d20s, taking the lowest one. And then going from there, what damage die do I use? Mm -hmm. um, do I know which one it is? Yeah. D12s rarely get used, <laughs> for instance. Battle axe. Uh, <laughs> they or varying hit points. <laughs> right. They, they rarely get used. You forget about them or you roll something different. It's easy to confuse a d8 and a d10 yeah. is another common dice mistake that yeah. I see. So just make sure... Um, that you know which die you're rolling for damage. Um, some players roll it all at once, and you'll see them rolling mm -hmm. three or four d20s and a bunch of other dice, and you know maybe it's all color coded so that they can look at it. You know, all of my green dice represent my first attack, all of my red dice my second attack, mm -hmm. and that's okay. But you might want to just I, I think starting out with rolling your attack separately, then rolling your damage. Um, is going to be the way to go to get more comfortable with it. So if you're a first-time player, it never hurts to identify the another player at the group that is fighting something and go, I attack the thing that this guy's attacking. Right. And, and focus fire is always a sound strategy. And just like picking a combat buddy right. is, is a good sort of rule of thumb. If you're playing... Um, combat abilibuddy? 
a combat ability. Yeah. <laughs> if you're playing a, uh, a warrior type uh, as your first uh, character, which a lot of role-playing groups will recommend that you play a warrior type. Well, mo more than likely, they're going to give you the Dragonborn ba Barbarian. They, yeah, something like that. You know, a simple character that really just does one thing. I think that pigeonholes new players, and new players should let their imaginations go wild And when yeah. they make new characters. They shouldn't feel compelled to play a simple character mm -hmm. or a character that doesn't have a lot of mechanical complexity just because mm -hmm. they're new. Um, but there are a lot of tables where that's sort of the default that you know you're playing a, a you know a dumb fighter uh, as your first character, which you know don't let them pigeonhole you into it. Pick a buddy. You're like, okay, I'm, I'm a fighter character. I made with the basic rules. I got my I got my dice that I need. Maybe there's a rogue in combat who who is going to want to really really appreciate having a tough, strong warrior type that's always next to them in combat, making sure that they can use their rogue abilities um, and, and make sure that there's somebody on hand to help them out. If you're playing a caster and uh, as your first character and you you know you have a wide array of spells, then sort of like understanding it like, okay, my spells are meant to help my allies. So you know make sure that you know like okay, which character in the party is going to most benefit mm -hmm. from my bless spell? or right. from uh, you know, a healing spell, something like that. If you're playing a more offensive-oriented caster, whether it's dealing damage to the enemy or hindering them with magical effects, I'm going to make sure I use my sleep on this one uh, enemy or um, you know, the hypnotic pattern. You know, you know, I'm going to cast that first. I'm going to make sure I tell the rest of my party so they're not accidentally caught in it. Right. The game can be very complex in this area and and some groups can get like really into it strategizing mm -hmm. working out their tactics round to round and other players they just like it's a free for all right. and once initiative is rolled everybody picks a target and they fight until you know they're all they're yeah. all down and it, one thing new players should know is generally you know new newer parties will be a little bit more chaotic and random. It's just going to be a bit more chaotic and random. And then as you adventure together and get to know what each other's abilities can do, you start naturally developing those tactics yeah. and strategies. Right. And so there are two actions in combat that I would uh, that I would recommend highly that all new players keep in mind. And, and if you're ever faced with a situation where it's like, I don't know what to do. I don't know what the right course of action is. I don't know who I should help, who I should whatever. There are two actions you can take. If you think you're pretty survivable in combat, uh, and, and you, you don't mind mixing it up. And then you identify in your party the heaviest hitter and you say, I'm going to help that person. Mm -hmm. and that means that you are taking the help action, granting them advantage on their next attack. And it's just a good way to be like, I don't know what I should do. Should I attack this one? Should I not? You can just say, you know what? This guy seems like they're doing, a, a, you know, that they're really effective. Uh, I'm just going to help them. You're participating in the fight, but it's, uh, you know, you, you don't have to roll any dice for it. If you're sort of brand new to the game and worried about it, then it's a, it's a valid action. The other one is dodge. Yeah. And if you're ever in a situation where you're like, hey, what do I do? There's no one around that I can help. Then you just say, you know what? Taking the dodge action this round. Um, and that get, that imposes disadvantage on an enemy trying to attack you because you're actively trying to defend yourself. Yeah. And uh, it's just a good way to to say, you know what, this round I'm not ready to 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 decide what I want to do, um, and, and I need a, I need you know another round to kind of think about it. Dodge is going to help you survive a bit more. There are other actions you can do. You can delay, um, mm -hmm. but that's kind of more of an ad advanced uh, maneuver yeah. uh, in well, terms of you know what your trigger is, mm -hmm. using reactions. Um, I would recommend just keeping your back pocket. You can help, you can attack, or you can dodge. Yeah. Always ask your DM. Mm -hmm. you know, if you if you ever feel like you're in a situation where I don't know what to do, you know I don't know what's going to help the party. I don't know what's going to I think it's perfectly valid for you to take a step back and go, you know what, I, I want to make sure I don't make things worse for the party. Mm -hmm. What should I do? Yeah. Well, um, before you, you know. take a step back, you want to disengage, though. You do want to disengage. Uh, otherwise, the enemy is going to get an attack on you. So, I mean, <laughs> that's the combat pillar. Yeah. It might take up a lot of game time. And certainly the, in the player's handbook, there are a lot of rules related to combat because combat is a more complex way yeah. of, uh, of playing the game. So let's let's move on to more uh, exploration. Uh -huh. The exploration and uh, the social interaction side is where you're gonna see, I think, more skills used. Right. Which is something else we need to really get into. Mm -hmm. But exploration. Yeah. Looking around, seeing your environment, how you interact with that. How are you exploring? The exploration pillar encompasses two very broad modes of play here. We're talking um, exploring a location, whether mm -hmm. that's a, a house in the city that you guys are investigating or a dungeon out in the wilderness or the travel that it takes 
to get from the city to the dungeon. Those are all sort of... I, I kind of think most of the game, that most of any given campaign is, is exploration in some way because it, it's, it's the DM describing what, your, uh, what the environment around you is like and then you describing to the DM how you interact with that mm-hmm. environment. In very broad terms, that's what interaction is. Uh, it's asking questions of the DM, yeah. understanding that the relationship between player and DM when they are engaged in exploration play is that the DM is the substitute for the senses of your player character. Mm-hmm. The DM is your eyes, your ears, your sensation. If you ever feel like you don't have enough information to make a decision, that's when you need to ask your DM, hey, can I get a better description of what this environment is like? What yeah. does my character see? What do they hear? They might require you to make a perception roll or to reference your passive perception score. Um, and so be ready to you know to know, okay, what's my perception you know, modifier? That's gonna be a D20 roll plus your perception, or um, you know, it might be passive perception, which is just 10 plus your modifier. Yeah. Perception is very often called for in exploration, but the basis of exploration play is asking questions, uh, interacting with the things that your DM describes to you. Some DMs just want to skill roll and get it over with, yeah. you know? and other DMs really want to get into it and want you to interact with the environment by asking questions. Yeah, it's one of those things where you, you don't want to ask the wrong question or you don't want to look like an idiot, but it's okay. Everybody who played this game played it for the first time at some point, right. and looked foolish and felt foolish. And even veteran, even me, even veteran players, people who've been playing longer than me, feel foolish sometimes with what they're trying to do and and how they approach the game because you are taking a risk and 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 putting yourself out there and saying like well I, I think we should do this or this is something that I mm-hmm. uh, am I'm curious about in the game and I, I want to know more about it um, so never be afraid to ask questions and get more information definitely and and exploration also uh, it can affect like how you're exploring are you sneaking around while you're doing this? right 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 um, are you moving quickly mm-hmm. and that all these things can affect what the DM wants you to do and how they want you to Role. There's a lot of things like I think as a new player you might want to ask questions of yourself like okay if, if my party is about to be engaged in say a week long trek into the wilderness uh, to reach a forgotten temple of some kind then like what do I do during that week? Seven days of walking for eight hours a day. Does your character pass away the time with idle chit chat? Are they the silent stalking type who is you know always ready for danger? Are they keeping an eye out for food and, and opportunities to find a, a quiet place to rest? Mm-hmm. Um, and just letting the DM know, hey, when we're on the march, my character is usually doing X. Right. They're quietly playing their, you know, their harp just to give everybody, uh, you know, something pleasant to listen to. Yeah. A marching, a marching rhythm. A marching right. rhythm, or they, you know, are always watching our back. You know, they, my character is always keeping an eye on where we've been to make sure nobody's following us. Um, what do I do during camp? You know, when we set up camp for the night, do I? Uh, make a search of the perimeter to make sure that, that everything's fine. Mm-hmm. Do I gather firewood or try to do a little hunting? Are you the party's cook? Or are you the party's lookout? What order of watch are you going to take to make sure that nobody sneaks mm-hmm. up on the party in the middle of the night? Those are all opportunities to interact with the environment. And it, it, you know, if your DM is, is on point and, and really, uh, really understands the environment they're trying to portray to you Mm -hmm. those are also opportunities for you to learn more about what's going on yeah and and to ask those questions and to get the information that you need to make better decisions in the game and then you know when you get to the actual location it's like what do you do in the dungeon are you holding a torch are you opening doors are Mm -hmm. you first in the marching order are you somewhere in the middle those are all elements of exploration play that you could want to give some thought to exactly so let's go ahead and move to the third and final element which is social interaction Okay. Right. You explored the dungeon. You fought the stuff. You fought the dragon. Yeah. And then now you've come back to town, <laughs> right? Yeah. And you gotta you gotta interact with the person that gave you the quest, or maybe a shop owner. Or... You, I'll give you a pro tip for all new players: if you want to get on your DM's good side, treat their NPCs as if they're real people. I, it's just one of those things where it's very easy. The advice for DMs that I would give is never expect your players to treat your NPCs like they're real people. Uh, but you know, you're it, setting yourself up for heartbreak. Right, you really are. But if you take the time to go, okay, I'm talking to the uh, to the Baron over here. This guy's family has governed this plot of land for several hundred years, and, and you know, it's my social better. Maybe some deference, or you know, the situations are reversed. Understanding where 
your character fits into the larger world is key towards really satisfying interaction and role play between NPCs and PCs. Mm -hmm. You don't always have to be 100% in your character's head. What would they do? How would they interact? That's one way of playing the game. Other people like to take a step back and and think of their character as a playing piece that they move around the world. Uh, Everybody gets into character in a different way. Well, yeah, I was going to say, whether you're first person, you speak like, oh, I do this, blah, 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 or you say, my character does this. Right. Or third person, you know. Maybe you use a voice, and, yeah. and you and you want to come up with a, with, a, with a voice for your character. You, you shouldn't feel pressure to do that. Some right. people really like it, some people don't, but it's an option, and, yeah. and not the only way to play. The goal of most... Uh, interaction, social interaction in a uh, as a pillar of play is to get information. There is a mystery that we need to solve and talking to this NPC will, will help us get that. And so understanding that in the same way that we, when it comes to combat, the goal of any given combat is to overcome the opposition to get to your objective. Right. Then the goal in a social interaction is to extract as much information as you can out of this interaction so that you can make a better decision after that. Right. If you leave a social interaction scratching your head and going, well, that wasn't helpful, then a couple of things have gone on. Either the DM has just done a poor job of describing the situation to you, and mm-hmm. maybe it's time for some clarification, or the DM is being purposefully confusing, vague, and that should be a clue mm-hmm. in and of itself. Right. I really like the interaction and role-playing part of the game because it's an opportunity for dispensing information to players and if they're picking up on the clues, if they're making connections and thinking through the logical conclusions to things, why is an NPC acting a certain way? What are they not telling me? Mm -hmm. Uh, What do I know about this NPC? What do I know to be true about them? So an example of this might be, you know, a a cleric or, or a priestly type who, you know, through magic could easily accomplish something, and yet it seems like this is a, you know, a a hurdle or an issue for them. That could be, you know, just a lapse in judgment on my part, in which I've just forgotten about a thing that they can do, and and drawing it to my attention will will be like, oh yeah, totally, and now I have to rethink my scenario. Mm -hmm. Or it could be that thinking about, you know, an interaction in those terms gives the player a tip-off that something's up. Right. That's, that that's a clue in and of itself, or that's a piece of useful information. And so that's ultimately what the goal is of, of social interaction is, is um, you know, outside of just like, here's the quest, go do it. Mm-hmm. We did the quest, here's your reward. Like, that's barely Yay. social interaction. That's the, that's the equivalent of a goblin, a single goblin attacks the party and is dead with before the first round is over. Right, you know, before, that before it even really gets to his com- <laughs> Right, that wasn't really combat. Right. <laughs> uh, those social interactions are barely uh, interactions with the NPCs. Okay, we've gone through the three pillars of play. Right. You have certain things that are abilities. Yeah. Right? These are your strength, your dexterity, your mm-hmm. constitution, your intelligence. Your statistics, your, your the, the, the six sacred stats of Dungeons & Dragons. So there's three types of basic roles. I think that's kind of where you're getting yes, at. Yes, that's where I'm going to go to. Uh, that you will make in 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons. Yeah. And because of legacy and a lot of DMs having started in other editions and carrying over that knowledge, they might use different terminology for these. But the three basic roles, and these all use a D20, and they are ability checks sometimes known as a skill roll, uh, mm-hmm. which is like test your strength against breaking open this door, wrestling this opponent to the ground, testing your intellect against remembering a piece of esoteric lore. Mm-hmm. They may be skill checks, more than likely will be skill checks, but they might just be the raw ability score as well. Right, um, right. That's your first one. The second one is saving throws. This is where I see a lot of people get confused because in some editions, a saving throw is just a another type of ability check. But in 5th edition, it's a separate thing. Mm -hmm. Um, And the reason for this is because sometimes you might be asked to, say, make a constitution check, which is different than a constitution saving throw. Right. And that's important to know uh, because the those six stats that you have are used for both your skills as Mm -hmm. well as your saving throws. Yeah, yeah. Something uh, that might help is, like, say, if you need to keep drinking, that might be a constitution (laughs) check. Right. Right. Yeah. But if you were to drink poison, right, then that's a that would be a constitution save because it's it's <laughs> adversely affecting you 
direct, like, at that right. moment. I, I think the line between check and saving throw is arbitrary and fuzzy, but it is the way the rule works yeah. in 5th edition. Well, it's, I've always seen it as when something, when any kind of situation is immediately going to adversely affect you, yeah. then that calls for a save. Think of it very much as the, this is my character's chance to avoid this harmful effect. Right. Almost always come up when the negative consequence of a save is, is sort of detrimental to, right. the, uh, to the player. Or to the character, sorry. Mm -hmm. Hopefully not to the player. You know, whereas a, a, a check, an ability check is like, well, if you fail this, maybe nothing bad happens. You just don't accomplish what you want. Mm -hmm. You almost never want to fail a save. Although there are circumstances where you might. Uh, and then the third is an attack roll, which right. is, you know, usually based on either strength or con, or sorry, strength or dex. Uh, but there are other types. Spell attack rolls might use your spell casting stat, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Um, these are... Uh, influenced by a lot of modifiers, you know, they're influenced by your proficiency bonus, which is a, which is contingent on your level. Uh, these roles are influenced by your ability score. Mm -hmm. um, you know, having a high strength makes it easier to attack with strength-based attacks, etc. Right. Um, but there are other things, whether you whether you're using magic through a spell or a magic item, that will influence these roles. So if you ever have a question of like, yeah, I'm supposed to roll this d20, but I don't know exactly how much I'm supposed to roll, then man, if if you're new to the game, just talk it out. Just feel like, okay, I got a d20. I, my proficiency bonus is two. My stat bonus is three. That's a plus five. But I'm also getting that bless over here, so that's an extra d4 that I'm rolling right. and just like talk it out because for a lot of a lot of people they've, they've internalized these steps mm -hmm. they you know they've been playing long enough that they don't need to think about it much they just grab the dice and roll yeah. and so it, it's not always helpful to look and see what your fellow players are doing because right. they might not be telling you everything exactly if you talk it out and, and just you know think out loud for a minute yeah but but I mean on a, on a base level though your race or your class or your background is going to give you what's called proficiency right. in certain skills, saves, whatever, mm -hmm. attacks with weapons. Yeah. And you have a proficiency bonus. So right. if you're proficient, you add that. You add that bonus. Well, every other attack, save, skill also is connected to one of your abilities. Right. And you always add that yeah. to whatever that attack, save, skill is. Yeah. And so, I mean, like with just taking, remembering that, you know, okay, well, I'm always going to add my ability, whether it's positive or negative. Yeah. And then I'm also proficient. Well, then I get to add my proficiency bonus. Right. Well, at least that it, you have at that moment, well, I have a base of what I am going to add to that D20 roll. Right. It does result in, in scenarios where you might have a character where they're proficient in a skill but that proficiency bonus is so low that they're getting more of a bonus from their ability. Mm -hmm. And this is also a good time to say you don't need to be proficient in something to attempt an action. Mm -mm. You don't need to be good at something to attempt the action. Mm -hmm. and, and a DM should always give you a small chance to succeed mm -hmm. as well as a small chance to fail if you, you know, otherwise have it in the bag. It's possible to create characters that are so good at something that they only fail when they roll a one. Yeah, <laughs> and, and 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 conversely, it's it's possible to create characters and, and try to and face obstacles where they're only going to succeed on the roll of a twenty. And those scenarios are are, are likely to come up. But don't mm -hmm. feel like that what you have written on your character sheet and what your skills and abilities are there define what you can do. Yeah, always know that uh, that within within certain very broad limits, you can just do whatever you want, and and it's really a matter of getting comfortable enough with the game mm -hmm. and what your character can do that when the DM goes, hey, what do you want to do? You already know what you're looking for. Let's move on to actions. Yeah. Different types of actions. Well, first off, what's the first thing you do when you go into combat? I mean, the DM's gonna call for initiative. Right. Uh, that's a uh, dexterity check. That yeah. is to say, a, a, a roll your raw dexterity and adding that ability. There are certain things that might add to it, but it's a, basically just a, uh, an ability check that that's going to determine the order that you uh, that you go in. It's always useful to know who goes immediately before you, right? So that you can be ready for when your uh, round comes along. And then, uh, you know, like I said earlier, we there are three sort of actions, basic actions you can perform in combat. You can attack, you can help, you can dodge, mm -hmm. but you can also do things like grapple. You can delay your action yeah. in case you're waiting for uh, the enemy to do something mm -hmm. before you. Um, you can try to use an object uh, or something, inter yeah. interact with your environment in some way. And those are just the ones that are covered in the player's handbook. There's other things that your DM might let you get away with uh, just to ask. Can I do this? Right. And the DM might say, yeah, but it's going to take a couple of rounds, or yes, but it's going to require some kind of ability check. 
Um, this is one of those areas where I advise DMs to be as accommodating and, and, and uh, facilitating of player ideas as mm -hmm. much as possible and to say like, yeah, that, that has a small chance of succeeding or that has a greater chance of succeeding right. and, and letting you try those things. Well, I mean, you don't want to, you know, you don't want to stifle creativity. Yeah. Um, you know, just because someone's inexperienced, I mean, you know, from the mouths of babes comes yeah. wisdom sometimes, so. Yeah, and I, I think that the big thing to remember as a new player, and the thing that I see new players get in trouble with most is how much they can do in a round of combat. Right. Because they might want, they might describe wanting to do like four or five different things. Yeah. And then you have to tell them like, well, you can really only do two of those. Right. Well, um, beca because basically on your turn, I mean, you can do, like you said, an, it, it's called an action. So yeah. I can attack, or I can help, or whatever. Yeah. Cast a spell, do something else. Yeah. And then you can also move. You can also which move. Most players have an average move of like 30 feet. Right? Uh huh. And, but you can also do what's called a bonus action. You can, and those are usually unlocked with uh, class abilities, spells, things like mm -hmm. that. You know, if you're making a brand new character, the amount of bonus actions that you can, that you have access to, is probably pretty limited. Right. Um, if any. If any. I, you know, bonus action is one of those things that you get one bonus action. You know, right. They're not unlimited. If, if you've got an ability that you that you get from a character, or I don't, not, I don't think. Off the top of my head, I can't think of any racial abilities that are bonus actions, but I might be misremembering. Mm -hmm. Just read up on it. What are the mm -hmm. conditions for it? This is one of the things where I think like the way that character sheets are laid out in 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 most role playing games are unhelpful for new players yeah. because a lot of times it's just a mass of information. It's not necessarily organized in a way that's conducive to being like, what can I do? Mm -hmm. uh, it's a lot of times it's sort of crammed in there, and it's why I am a huge fan of the blank sheet of paper school of character sheet design, yeah. where it's like write down what you need on your character sheet as you need it because everyone needs something different every character's different you know you might have a character sheet where you have your stats <laughs> and a list of your skills and Excuse then me. a bunch of actions that you can take in combat or out of combat and and letting you uh mm -hmm. see sort of less like here's my character and all the stuff they have on them and all the gear and everything else and, and a lot of the character sheets gonna be wasted space because you don't you're not using a certain portion of it uh, but if you make your own and just use a blank sheet of paper, um, then then you have the opportunity to, to write out your individual actions that you can do and have those handy uh, real quick. So that's kind of what you can do on your turn. And then there's only like one other small thing, which is called a reaction. And you've, you've mentioned that yeah. a few minutes back, but it's something that like triggers not on your turn. Somebody yeah. else does something. Somebody else does something. Uh, and well, it depends. The reactions are can be. You can use a reaction on your turn. Uh, for instance, yeah. <laughs> you know. Te technically, yes. <laughs> for instance, uh, an example of that might be. You know, you're a spellcaster. You've cast a spell. There is another spellcaster there who has countered that spell, thus negating it. But you also know the ability. You also have a spell that lets you counter magic. So you might say. I use my reaction on my turn to counter the counter spell. That's right. a legit uh, way of uh, using that and is one of the few cases I can think of where you would take a reaction on your turn. Just make sure the first spell is a cantra. <laughs> it, it's, it doesn't have to be. It mm. can be, I look at the sage advice, man. Really? Yeah, they, they, it doesn't count against, uh, you can cast like a fireball and a counter spell. To Even counter spell, it, yeah. It's it's uh, it, it's always it surprises a lot of people, but uh, the Sage Advice is a column uh, you can follow it on Twitter where they uh, the creators of the game sort of clarify things. You can sort of write into them. I read it because I'm a, you know, a huge dork like that, um, and and sort of follow it. Uh, but yeah, they they talk about edge cases like that. Like what do you you know can you counter a counter spell and and does it count against your normal limit of spells you can cast? in a round, um, it doesn't. The main way that you're gonna get a reaction is through delaying your action. Yeah. And a delayed action is where you say, I'm not ready to act right now, or I want a certain condition to come about in combat, uh, and then you know I'm waiting for the goblin to run up to me before I hit him. Mm -hmm. I am waiting for uh, you know the wizard to pop out from behind cover before I shoot them with my arrow. Yeah. Um, and then that you say you tell the DM that, and then when that condition happens, you can usually take one action. You can do one thing. Right. Um, and so uh, that's that's kind of the quickest way I can think of to unlock a reaction. There are other abilities and spells mm -hmm. that. Uh, well, the, the only other thing I can think of really is just uh, an, a t an opportunity attack. Opportunity attack is another way to use yeah. your reaction. Yeah. You're, you're in combat with someone, they want to just bug out, Yeah. and they don't 
they don't do what's called the disengage action right. to basically kind of extricate themselves. I always imagine that as like swinging the sword out wide, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. and then running away really quick. Yeah, yeah. But they just turn tail and run. Well, guess what? You can make an opportunity to attack. Poke them in the back, yeah. you know. Uh, and so these are things that they don't always come up in every combat uh, or, or are, you know, always there, but they are options available to you. Right. And as you get more comfortable with the game, as you understand what you can do in it, and you you know you you become more proficient in the game, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. then uh, then you might want to start branching out and thinking of what you can do in these terms of delayed actions, using your reaction, and there are ways of like completely squeezing the most mechanical effectiveness out of your bonus action, your reaction, your action. Uh, it's um, it's a very uh, it can be very complicated, but starting yeah. out, you don't need to worry about a lot of that stuff. You just need to be aware that it exists. Yeah, yeah, you just <laughs> need to know it's there. Yeah. And uh, as you play, of course, you'll get more comfortable with it, and it'll become right. second nature. Every group plays the game differently, and it is worthwhile if you're starting out or even have been playing for a long time to, to game with as many different people as you have available. I know for a lot of our viewers and for a lot of people, including myself, for a long time, it was difficult to find players, difficult to find groups to, of people to play with. So mm -hmm. if, if you've been invited into a group and it's the only group you've ever known, then it, it's gonna be difficult to say, go off somewhere else and experience how other people are playing. But if you have the opportunity, and I think it's worthwhile to seek out those opportunities. Play with as many different people as you can because it could be that the group that got you into role playing is n doesn't play the game the way that's best for you. And right. until you find that group, you might think like, man, this role playing thing's kind of rotten. Like I'm playing, you know, I, I had a really bad experience because I was playing with people who were bossy or wanted to control what I was doing or who were mm -hmm. only into combat or who never wanted to fight and just wanted to sit around and talk in weird accents all day. You want to experience as much of the hobby as you can so that you know what you like, what you don't like.